The reading is taken from Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 to 29. The purpose of the law. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring would come to whom the promise had been made, and it was ordained through angels by a mediator. Now a mediator involves more than one party, but God is one. Is the law opposed to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could make alive, then righteousness would indeed come through the law. But the Spirit has imprisoned all things under the power of sin, so that what was promised through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before the faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that the faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Jesus Christ you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptised into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This is the word of the Lord. Our Gospel reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 8, and I'm reading verses 26 to 39. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerizines, which is opposite Galilee. As Jesus stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him, and he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding. The demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission, and then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who'd seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerizines asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the city, how much Jesus had done for him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. Now let's pray. And I pray that I may speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now you might be uh, sitting here with bated breath, wondering if I'm going to uh, preach on the Gospel passage and explain that story of the pigs to you. No, I'm going to preach on Galatians, which uh, is not without its own challenge today. So uh, Galatians chapter 3, which Eric read for us. We live in a divided world. I don't need to tell you that. We'll know looking around our own country and across the world that there are divisions between rich and poor, between people whose skin is a different colour, between people of different genders and different nationalities, 
and different religions and people who express their sexuality differently. Too often we don't see people standing side by side and it might be a little bit hard to see but that's people holding hands, people with different skin colours, united. So often that isn't the experience, is it? It's people fighting and competing and set against one another. And we like to think that the church is different, but uh, Christians are too often divided. There are certainly barriers between different denominations. Uh, you only have to look at countries, Christian countries, uh, where Protestants and Catholics are set against each other or different denominations are critical. And within our Anglican church, there are divisions too. We find it hard to agree. So it might be tempting to look back nostalgically to a time when Christians all agreed and uh, there weren't any difficult questions and people didn't uh, squabble or disagree. So I'm just going to burst that nostalgic bubble because the early church wrestled with big questions just as much as we do. And in that letter, St Paul's letter to the Galatians, there was a huge argument going on and a huge theological question to be tackled. Galatians is called Paul's angry letter. I don't know if you've ever had uh, cause to write an angry letter or maybe post something on Facebook or uh, send an angry email. But if you have, you'll know that surge of adrenaline that you get when uh, something just isn't right and you need to uh, put pen to paper or type, type out something on the keyboard. Well, Paul put a uh, quill to parchment, or his scribe did, because he was furious. When he wrote to the Galatians, he didn't start with words of thanksgiving as he did in every other letter, where he would always say, I'm so grateful for your faith and the faith of those there. He starts with a blistering attack. I'm astonished. I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ. And then you foolish Galatians, Paul is absolutely furious. So what was the problem? Well, the problem was that the Galatians wanted to be circumcised or who had fallen under the influence of those who said this was necessary. Why is that so bad, you might think? Well, an argument was raging between Jewish and Gentile Christians. Jewish believers argued that converts should follow the points of the Jewish law and Jewish practices, which included circumcision, and that to be followers of Christ, they would need to wholeheartedly adopt the Jewish law. Paul argued that faith in crucified Christ was enough. There's no need to put any other barriers and practices on top. Paul vehemently argued that Christians that belonged to the family of God and that the Gentile Christians, the Greeks and all the others, were just as welcome. In fact, he argued that to do more than that was to undermine salvation through the death and resurrection of Jesus. People are made right with God through faith in Jesus alone and nothing else. And that there were no longer any barriers between Jews and Gentiles between male and female, between slave and free. All those barriers have been put aside. In fact, Paul goes on to say, it's baptism is the mark of belonging and believing, and that is enough. Uh, this is the River Jordan. I don't know if I've mentioned that I've been to Jordan, but this is the River Jordan. And uh, looking across, standing on the Jordan side of the River Jordan, looking across to the Israeli side where there was a baptism going on. Even today, baptism is the mark of believing and belonging. As many of you who are baptised into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. That is it. That is the mark of the inward grace. And that is enough. Uh, how many of you, went, when you went to school, wore school uniforms? 
Yeah, it's still a very English-British thing to do, isn't it? And I know my American husband uh, doesn't get this school uniform business, but uh, to be quite honest, I think it's a good thing, school uniforms, because um, it, it evens people out, doesn't it? It reduces competition. It doesn't erase the person, but when you put it on, it gives you a mark of identity and a sense of belonging. And I know those of you who've had children go through high school will know the battles that you have to have for them to uh, keep the uniform regulations because they want, to, they want to cast that aside. But that sense of we're in this together, that we, we adopt, we put on a uniform. Well, St Paul says, baptism is the uniform. Baptism is what we clothe ourselves with. This is the sign of God's grace, of the freedom and forgiveness that Jesus brings. Baptism is our uniform. And when we wear that uniform, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs to the promise. The adoption of the, the, Christ, the Gentile believers who became Christians alongside the Jewish believers were still adopted equally into Abraham's family, going right back to uh, the very beginnings of Judaism. This doesn't just mean that all are welcome. It means that all are equal. All are equal. Equally loved by God, equally loved and saved by the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, Paul didn't say this lightly. He was drawing a line in the sand against those who preached a gospel of faith and circumcision. No, says Paul, there's no room for a halfway house. The equality and faith of all believers must not be compromised. There are no second class citizens in the kingdom of God. I have to say that future generations of the church have frequently failed in that promise. Slavery was tolerated and actively encouraged in Christian countries for centuries. Slave and free didn't seem to be equal. People of different nationalities and skin colours have been discriminated against in churches. Women have been excluded from leadership in churches a principle that has only recently, relatively recently, been addressed and I would say still isn't fully embedded in the Anglican Church. And then gay and lesbian Christians have been persecuted and kept out and told that conversion from their lifestyle is the only option. Well, St Paul didn't put that in his verse, but I think we can extend the principle of equality. At the end of July, or the middle of July, our Anglican bishops from across the world will gather for the Lambeth Conference. Uh, they all come together, and they are there to worship but to discuss big questions. And there will be much that uh, they can't agree on. And sexuality will be one of the huge questions that they look at. The affirmation and equality of gay and lesbian people within the church. Now, last November, some of us here at St John's looked at the Living in Love and Faith course, which is material produced by the Church of England, looking at uh, and acknowledging different points of view in the interpretation of scripture and attitudes to sexuality. But that really is only just the beginning. We acknowledged that there are different points of view, but we didn't really uh, come to an answer. Churches will need to tackle the difficult questions to acknowledge whether people of all genders and sexualities are welcome and equally loved by God. As a church, and I mean a church local as well as a church national, we will have to do this. We will have to say where we stand and to do the hard work of grappling with scripture and our understanding of God. St Paul told the Galatians that the gospel of Christ could not include the practice of circumcision. He said, you can't have it both ways. Now I would say that questions of inclusivity that are going to be discussed are not questions of salvation. You can be saved, I hugely believe this, 
uh, but stand on opposite sides of the debate. But I think they are huge questions of justice. Other Christians will see this differently. We may find ourselves standing on opposite sides of the bridge. You might have wondered what the bridge building activity is about. Well, it's about the fact that uh, Galatians leads us, or the question more, uh, more specifically, the question of sexuality leads us to a bridge point. There will be Christians on both sides, and we won't always agree. I would hope, is that a transporter bridge, ship bridge, whatever that is? That, it's a what? A Baskill bridge, thank you. So it closes, doesn't it? I would hope that the bridge could close and that we'll find a meeting point. That would be my hope, that we wouldn't be permanently disunited that there would be accommodation for those in, who in conscience can't accept um, revised teaching and that there would be space for those of us who see it differently to stand on the bridge and still love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We will need to pray for those we disagree with. We need to pray for our bishops as they meet and debate and argue. What I don't think we have time for is to have the luxury of doing nothing. For too long, the inclusive love of God has been undermined by prejudice and done damage. But it isn't going to be an easy road. Any bridge building takes time, it takes hard work, and that's where I think we are now. Let us pray. Loving God, in our wrangling and our wrestling. May we not lose sight of your all-consuming love, the love that uh, in our baptism we were drawn into and the baptism which marks us as yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you told your disciples that we are all children of God through faith, all one in Christ Jesus. We thank you for your unfailing love and promise of everlasting life. You know us all and know what we need to pray about before we begin to speak to you. Thank you for that certainty. Lord, we bring before you our fractured world complicated and torn by religious and political power-seeking, which seem to be pulling the world apart. We ask for your help, particularly during the current wars and strife, that we will all be able to work together for peace and reconciliation at home and across the world. And we pray for all refugees that they may find peace and hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all who are facing the chaos of illness, loneliness, anxiety, those going through exams and waiting for results. We bring before you silently in our hearts all those about whom we are concerned, those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, those going through treatments, those for whom life has lost its meaning. So in a few moments of silence, we will pray for all those about whom we have concerns. Lord, thank you for your promises to us. Give us faith to move forwards and to help us all to support those in need. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we pray for those in our community and beyond who are finding life difficulty, uh, difficult at present. We give thanks for our food bank and those who give their time freely and generously to support those in need. We pray for parts of the world where there is no regular supply of food or water and pray for the organisations who are giving aid to these stricken parts of the world. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lastly, Lord, we pray for our family, friends, our village community and our church and ourselves. 
Thank you for the fellowship that worshipping together brings to us all. Bless all our outreach into the community, and particularly our heritage building project, so that all can worship together in your holy place. We often have little faith during these difficult times, but help us to know that you are there, even in the silence, giving us not what we want, but what you know we need. Help us to listen to your voice. Amen. Amen. Merciful Father, accept Amen. these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.